The Snow Image, A Childish Miracle by Nathaniel Hawthorne One afternoon of a cold winter's day, when the sun shone forth with chilly brightness, after a long storm, two children asked leave of their mother to run out and play in the new fallen snow. The elder child was dear girl, whom, because she was of a tender and modest disposition, and were thought to be very beautiful. Her parents and other people who were familiar with her used to call Violet, but her brother was known by the style a little of pony, on account of the rudeness of his broad and round little peats, which made everybody think of sunshine and grey scarlet flowers. The father of these two children, a certain Mr. Lindsay, it is important to say, was an excellent but exceedingly matter-of-fact source of man, a dealer in hardware, and was sturdily accustomed to take what is called the common sense view of all matters that came under his consideration. With a heart about as tender as other people's, he had a head as hard and impenetrable, and therefore, perhaps as empty, as one of the iron pots which it was a part of his business to sell. The mother's character, on the other hand, had a strength of poetry in it, a trace of unworldly beauty, a delicate and dewy flower, as it were, that had survived out of her imaginative youth and still kept itself alive amid the dusty realities of matrimony and motherhood. So Violet and Peony, as I began with saying, besought their mother to let them run out and play in the new snow, for, though it had looked so dreary and dismal, drifting downward out of the grey sky, it had a very cheerful aspect. Now that the sun was shining on it, the children dwelt in a city and had no wider play place than a little garden before the house, divided by a white fence from the street and with a pear tree and two or three palm trees overshading it, and some rose bushes just in front of the parlor windows. The trees and chirps, however, were now leafless, and that week were enveloped in the light snow which thus made a cause of wintry foliage, with here and there a pendant icicle for the fruit. Yes, Violet, yes, my little pony, said the kind mother. You may go out and play in the new snow. Accordingly, the good lady bundled up her darlings in woolen jackets and wedded sacks, and put comfort around their necks, and a pair of strips Guiders on each little pair of legs, and wore state mittens on their hands, and gave them a kiss apiece, by way of a spell to keep away Jack Frost, for self the two children, with a hop skip and jump, that carried them at once into the very heart of pure snow drifts, whence Violet emerged like a snow bunting, while little Puny frowned out with his round face in full bloom. Then what a merry time had they to look at them. Frolicking in the wintry garden, you would have thought that the dark and pitiless storm had been sent for no other purpose but to provide a new plaything for Violet and Peony, and that they themselves had been created. As the snow burst were, to take delight only the impressed and in the white mantle which is spread over the earth. At last, when they have frosted one another all over with handful of snow, Violet, after laughing hurriedly at little Peony's figure, was struck with a new idea. You look exactly like a snow image, Peony, said she. If your cheeks were not so red, and that puts me in mind, let us make an image out of snow, an image of little girl, 
and it shall be our sister, and shall run about and play with us all winter long. Won't it be nice? Oh yes! Cried Peony, as pearly as he could speak, for he was but a little boy. That will be nice, and Mamma shall see it. Yes, answered Violet. Mamma shall see the new little girl, but she must not make her come into the warm parlor, for you know our little snow sister will not love the warmth. And for with the children began its great business of making a snow image that should run about, while their mother, who was sitting at the window and overheard some of their talk, could not help smiling at the gravity with which they said about it. They really seemed to imagine that there would be no difficulty whatever in creating a live little girl out of the snow, and to say the truth. If miracles are ever to be wrought, it will be by putting your hands to the work in precisely such a simple and undoubting frame of mind as that in which Violet and Peony now undertook to perform one, without so much as knowing that it was a miracle. So thought the mother, and thought likewise that the new snow just fallen from heaven. Would be excellent material to make new beginnings of, if it were not so very cold. She gazed at the children a moment longer, delighting to watch their little figures. The girl, tall for her age, graceful and agile, and so delicately colored that she looked like a cheerful thought more than a physical reality, while Peony expanded in breadth. Rather than height, and roll along on his short and sturdy legs, as substantial as an elephant, though not quite so big. Then the mother resumed her work. What it was, I forget. But she was either trimming a silken bonnet for Violet, or darning a pair of stockings for little Peony's short legs. Again, however, and again. And yet, other again, she could not help turning her head to the window to see how the children got on with their snow image. Indeed, it was an exceedingly pleasant sight. Those bright little souls at their task. Moreover, it was really wonderful to observe how lonely and skilfully they managed the matter. Violet assumed the chief direction. And told Peony what to do, while with her own delicate fingers, she shaped out all the nicer parts of the snow figure. It seemed, in fact, not so much to be made by the children as to grow up under their hands, while they were playing and prattling about it. The mother was quite surprised at this, and the longer she looked, the more and more surprised she grew. What remarkable children my are! Thought she, smiling with a mother's pride and smiling at herself too for being so proud of them. What other children could have made anything so like little girl's figure of snow at the first trial? Well, but now I must finish Peony's new frock, for his grandfather is coming tomorrow, and I want the little fellow to look handsome. So she took up the frock and was soon as busily at work again with her needle as the two children with their snow image. But still, as the needle travelled hither and hither through the seams of the dress, the mother made her toy light and happy by listening to every voices of Violet and Peony. They kept talking to one another all the time. Their tongue being quiet as active as their feet and hands, except at intervals, she could not distinctly hear what was said, but had merely a sweet impression that they were in a most loving mood, and were enjoying themselves highly, and that the business of making the snow image went prosperously on. Now and then. However, when Violet and Peony happened to raise their voices, the words were as audible as if they had been spoken in the very parlor. 
where the mother sat. Oh, how delightfully those words echoed in her heart. Even though they meant nothing so very wise or wonderful after all. But you must know mother listens with her heart much more than with her ears. And thus, she is often delighted with her trills of crowds home music. When other people can hear nothing of the kind. Penny, Penny! cried Violet to her brother, who had gone to another part of the garden. Bring me some of the fresh snow, Peony, from the very first corner, where we have not been trembling. I wanted to share our little snow sister's bosom with. You know that part must be quite pure, just as it's come out of the sky. Here it is, Violet, answered Peony in his buff tone, but a very sweet tone too, as it came from the ring through the half trodden drifts. Here is the snow for her little bosom. Oh, Violet, how beautiful she begins to look. Yes, said Violet, softly and quietly. Our snow sister does look very lovely. I did not quite know, Peony, that we could make such a sweet little girl as this. The mother, as she listened, thought how fit and delightful an incident it would be if fairies, or still better, if angel children were to come from paradise and play in misery with her own darlings and help them to make their snow image, giving it to the fisher of Sarah's tales babyhood. Violet and Peony would not be aware of their immortal permits. Only they would see that the image grew very beautiful while they worked at it, and would think that they themselves had done it all. My little girl and boy deserve such permits, if mortal children ever did, said the mother to herself, and then she smiled again at her own motherly pride. Nevertheless, the idea sized upon her imaginations and ever and anon. She took a glimpse off of the window, half dreaming that she might see the golden hair children of paradise spotting with her own golden hair, violet and bright cheeked peony. Now for a few moments there was a busy and earnest but indistinct hum of the two children's voices as Violet and Peony wrought together with one happy consent. Violet still seemed to be the guiding spirit, while Peony acted rather as a laborer and brought her the snow from far and near. And yet the little urchin evidently had a proper understanding of the matter too. Peony, Peony, cried Violet, for her brother was again at the other side of the garden. Bring me those light wreaths of snow that have rested on the lower branches of the prayer tea. You can crumble on the small drift, peony, and reach them easily. I must help them to make some ringlets for our snow sister head. Here they are, Violet, answered the little boy. Take care you do not break them. Well done, well done, how pretty. Does she not look sweetly? said Violet, with a very satisfied tone. And now we must have some little shining bits of ice to make the brightness of her eyes. She's not finished yet. Mama will see how very beautiful she is, but Papa will say, Tosh nonsense! Coming out of the cold, let us call Mama to look out said Peony, and then he shouted lustily, Mama, 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 look out and see what a nice little girl we are making. The mother put down her work for an instant and looked out of the window, but it so happened that the sun for this was one of the shortest days of the whole year has sunken so nearly to the edge of the world that his sitting shy came up the gaily into the lady's eyes. So she was dazzled. You must understand and could not very distinctly observe what was in the garden. Still, however, through all that bright, 
blinding the soul of the sun and new snow. She beheld a small white figure in the garden that seemed to have a wonderful deal of human likeness about it. And she saw violet and peony. Indeed, she looked more at them than at the image. She saw the two children still at work, Peony bringing fresh snow, and Violet applying it to the figure as scientifically as a sculpture as clay to his model. Indistinctly, as she discerns the snow child, the mother thought to herself that never before was there a snow figure so cunningly made. Not ever such a dear little girl and boy to make it. They do everything better than our children, said she very complacently. No wonder they make better snow images. She sat down again to her work and made as much haste with it as possible, because twilight would soon come, and Peony's frock was not yet finished. And grandfather was expected by railroad pretty early in the morning. Faster and faster, therefore, went her flying fingers. The children likewise kept busily at work in the garden, and still the mother listened. Whenever she could catch a word, she was amused to observe how their little imaginations had got mixed up with what they were doing. And carried away by it, they seemed positively to think that the snow child would run about and play with them. What a nice playmate she will be for us all winter long," said Violet. "I hope Papa will not be afraid of her giving us a cold." Children, you love her dearly, Peony. Oh yes," cried Peony, "and I will hug her." And she shall sit down close by me and drink some of my warm milk. Oh no, Peony! And Sir Violet bit grave wisdom. That will not do at all. Warm milk will not be wholesome for our little snow sister. Little snow people like her eat nothing but ice cubes. No, no, Peony! We must not give her anything warm to drink. There was a minute or two of silence for Peony, whose short legs were never wearied, had gone on a pure image again to the other side of the garden. All of a sudden, Violet cried out loudly and joyfully, "Look here, Peony! Come quickly! Ella has been shining on her cheek out of that rose colored cloud, and the color does not go away. It's not that beautiful." Yes, it is beautiful," answered Peony, pronouncing the three syllables with deliberate accuracy. Oh, Violet! Only look at her hair; it is all like gold. Oh, certainly," said Violet, with tranquility, as if it were very much a matter of course. That color, you know, comes from the golden clouds. Let me see up there in the sky. She's almost finished now, but her lips must be made very red, redder than her cheeks. Perhaps, Peony, it will make them red if both kiss them. Accordingly, the mother heard to smile little smacks as if both of her children were kissing the snow image on its frozen mouth. But at this, did not seem to make the lips. Quite red enough. Violet next proposed that the snow child should be invited to kiss Peony's scarlet cheek. Come, little snow sister, kiss me! cried Peony. There, she has kissed you. Added Violet. And now her lips are very red, and she brushed a little too. Oh, was a cold kiss. Cried Peony. Just then, there came a breeze of the pure west wind, sweeping through the garden and rattling the parlor windows. It sounded so wintry cold that the mother was about to tap on the window pane with her thimble finger 
to summon the two children in. When the voice cried out to her with one voice, the tones were not a tones of surprise, although they were evidently a good deal excited. It appeared rather as if they were very much rejoiced at some event that had not happened, but which they had been looking for and had read one upon all along. Mama, mama, we have finished our little snow sister, and she is running about the garden with us. What imagination little beings my children are! Thought the mother, putting the last few stitches into Puny's fork, and it is string too. That they make me almost as much as Charles as they themselves are. I can hardly help believing. Now that the snow image has very come to life, dear mamma, cried Violet, pray look out and see what a sweet playmate we have. The mother, being thus interested, could no longer delay to look forth from the window. The sun was now gone out of the sky, leaving, however, a leash in her returns of his brightness. Among those purple and golden clouds, which made the sunsets of winter so magnificent, but there was not the slightest gleam or dazzle, either on the window or on the snow, so that the good lady could look all over the garden, and see everything and everybody in it. And what do you think she saw there? Violet and Peony, of course. Her own two darling children. Ah, but whom or what did she see besides? Why, if you will believe me, there was a small figure of a girl, dressed all in white, with rose tint cheeks and regrets of golden hue, playing about the garden with the two children. A stranger though she was. The child seemed to be on as familiar terms with Violet and Peony, and they with her as if all the three had been playmates during the whole of their real lives. The mother thought to herself that it must certain be the daughter of one of the neighbors, and that seeing Violet and Peony in the garden, the child had run across the street to play with them. So this kind lady went to the door. Intending to invite the little runaway into her comfortable parlor, for now that the sunshine was withdrawn, the atmosphere out of doors was already growing very cold. But after opening the house door, she stood an instant on the threshold, hesitating whether she ought to ask the child to come in, or whether she should even speak to her. Indeed, she almost doubted whether it were a real child after all, or only a light wreath of the new fallen snow, brought hither and thither about the garden by the intensely cold west wind. There was certainly something very singular in the aspect of the little stranger. Among all the children of the neighborhood, the lady could remember no such face. With its pure white and delicate rose color, and the golden ringlets tossing about the forehead and cheeks, and as for her dress, which was entirely of white and fluttering in the breeze, it was such as no reasonable woman would put upon a little girl when sending her out to play in the depth of winter. It made this kind and careful mother cheerful only to look at those small feet, with nothing in the world on them, except a very thin pair of white slippers. Nevertheless, early as she was clad, the child seemed to feel not the slightest inconvenience from the cold, but danced so lightly over the snow that the tips of her toes left hardly a print. It is so fast. While Violet could but just keep peace with her, and Peony's short legs compel him to lag behind. Once, in the course of their play, 
The strange child placed herself between Violet and Peony, and taking a hand of each, skipped merrily forward and down along with her. Almost immediately, however, Peony pulled away his little fist and began to rub it as if the fingers were tingling with cold, while Violet also released herself, though with rest at roughness. Gravely remarking that it was better not to take hold of hands, the white robes themselves said not a word, but danced about, just as merry as before. If Violet and Peony did not choose to play with her, she could make just as good a play miss of the bricks and cold west wind, which kept blowing her out about the garden, and took such liberty with her that they seemed to have been friends for a long time. All this while, the mother stood on the three shows, wondering how little girl could look so much like a frank snow drift, or how snow drift could look so very like a little girl. She called Violet and whispered to her, Violet, my darling, what is this child's name? asked she. Does she live near us? Why, Dallas, Mama, answered Violet, laughing to think that her mother did not comprehend so very plain an affair. This is our little snow sister, whom we have just been making. Yes, dear Mama, cried Peony, running to his mother and looking up simply into her face. This is our snow image. Is this not a nice little child? At this instant, a fox of snowbirds came fifthing through the air. As was very natural, they avoided Violet and Peony, but, and this looked strange, they flew at once to the white robed child, fluttered eagerly about her head, alighted on her shoulders, and seemed to claim her as an old acquaintance. She, on her part, was evidently as glad to see these little birds, all the widow's grandchildren, as they were to see her, and welcomed them by holding out both her hands. Hereupon, they each and all tried to align on her two palms and ten small fingers and thumbs, crowding one another off with an immense fluttering of their tiny wings. One dear little bird nestled tenderly in her bosom. Another put its bill to her lips. They were as joyous all the world, and seemed as much in their element as you may have seen them when sporting with a snowstorm. Violet and Peony stood laughing at this pretty sight, for they enjoyed the merry time which their new playmates was having with these small wings. Resistance, almost as much as if they themselves took part in it. Violet, said her mother, gravely perplexed, tell me the truth without any jest. Who is this little girl? My darling mama, answered Violet, looking seriously into her mother's face and apparently surprised that she should need any further explanation. I have told you truly who she is. It is our little snow image, which Peony and I have been making. Peony will tell you so as well as I. Yes, Mama. As a wretched Peony, which must grow in his crimson little piece. This is little snow child. Is not she a nice one? But, Mama, her hand is oh so very cold while mama still hesitated what to think and what to do the street gate was thrown open and the father of violet and peony appeared wrapped in a pilot cloth sack with a fur cap drawn down over his ears and the thickest of gloves upon his hands mr lindsay was a middle-aged man with a weary and yet happy look in his wind fresh and frost pinched face, and if he had been busy all the day long, 
and was glad to get back to his quiet home. His eyes brightened at the sight of his wife and children, although he could not help uttering a word or two of surprise at finding the whole family in the open air on so bleak a day. And after sunset too, he soon perceived the little white strangers parting to and fro in the garden like a dancing snow wreath, and the folds of snowbirds fluttering above her head. Play what little girl may that be, inquired this very sensible man. Surely her mother must be crazy to let her go out in such bitter weather as it has been today, with only that fancy white gown and those thin slippers. My dear husband, says his wife, I know no more about the little thing than you do. Some neighbor's child, I suppose. Our violet and peony, she added laughing at herself for repeating so abuse a story, insists that she is nothing but a snow image, which they have been busy about in the garden almost all the all afternoon. As she said this, mother glanced her eyes toward the spot where the children's snow image had been made. What was her surprise on perceiving that there was not the slightest trash of such much rubber, no image at all, no pile of heap of snow, nothing, whatever, except the friends are little footsteps around a vacant space. This is very strange, she said. What is strange, dear mother? asked Violet. Dear father, do not you see how it is? This is our snow image which Puny and I have made because we wanted another playmate. Did not me, Peony? Yes, Papa, said Crimson Puny. This be our little snow sister. Is she not beautiful? But she gave me such a cold kiss. Nonsense, children, cried the good, honest father, who, as we have already intimated, had an exceedingly common sensible way of looking at matters. Do not tell me of making live figures of, of snow. Come, wife, these little strangers must not stay out in the brick air a moment longer. We will bring her into the parlor, and you shall give her a supper of warm bread and milk, and make her as comfortable as you can. Meanwhile, I will inquire among the neighbors, or if necessary, send the city's carrier about the streets to give notice of a lost child. So, saying, this honest and very kind-hearted man was going toward the little white damsel with the best intentions in the world. But while and Pioneer, each seizing their father by the hand, earnestly besought him not to make her come in. Dear father, cried Violet, putting herself before him, it is true what I have been telling you. This is our little snow gold. And she cannot live any longer than while she breathed in cold west wind. Do not make her come into the hot room. Yes, father, shouted Peony, stamping his little foot. So mightily was he in earnest. This be nothing but our little snow child. She will not love the hot fire. Nonsense, children, nonsense, nonsense cried the father half vexed, half laughing at what he considered their foolish obstinacy. Run into the house this moment. It is too late to play any longer now. I must take care of this little girl immediately, or she will catch her death a cold. Husband, dear husband, says his wife in a low voice, for she had been looking narrowly at the snow shout and was more perplexed than ever. There is something very singular in all this. You will think me foolish, but, but, may it not be that some invisible angels has been attracted by the simplicity 
and good faith with which our children set about their undertaking? Husband, dear husband, says his wife in a low voice, for she had been looking narrowly at the snow shower and was more perplexed than ever. There is something very singular in all this. You will think me foolish, but, but, may it not be that some invisible angels has been attracted by the simplicity and good faith with which our children set about their undertaking? May he not have spent an hour of his immortality in playing with those dear little souls? And so, the result is what we call a miracle. No, no, do not laugh at me. I see what a foolish thought it is. My dear wife, replied the husband, laughing heartily. You are as much a child as Violet and Piony, and in one sense of she was, for all through life she had kept her heart full of childlike simplicity and faith, which was as pure and clear as crystal, and looking at all matters through this transparent medium. She sometimes saw truth so profound that other people laugh at them as nonsense and absurdity. But now Kai, Mr. Lindsay, had entered the garden, breaking away from his two children, who still sent their swift voices after him, beseeching him to let the snow shower stay and enjoy herself in the cold west wind. As he approached, the snow burst took to flight. The little white damsel also fled backward, shaking her head as if to say, Pray, do not touch me. And so gradually, as it appeared leading him through the deepest of the snow, once the good man stumbled and fouled down upon his face, so that, gathering himself up again, with the snow sticking to his rough pilot cloth sack, he looks as white as wintry as a snow image of the largest size. Some of the neighbors, meanwhile seeing him from their windows, wonder what could process poor Mr. Lindsay to be running about his garden in pursuit of a snow drift, which the west wind was driving hither and thither. At length, after the west deal of trouble, he chased the little stranger into a corner where she could not possibly escape him. His wife had been looking on, and its being nearly twilight, was wonder struck to observe how the snow shower gleams and sparkle, and how she seemed to shed a glow all round about her, and when driving into the corner, she positively christened like a star. It was a frosty kind of brightness, too, like that of an icicle in the moonlight. The wife thought, it's strange that good Mr. Lindsay should see nothing remarkable in the snow shower's appearance. Come, you old little thing, cries the honest man, seizing her by the hand. I have caught you at last, and will make you comfortable in spite of yourself. We will put a nice warm pair of busted stocking on your frosty little feet, and you shall have a good thick chow to wrap yourself in. Your poor white nose, I am afraid, is actually frostbitten, but we will make it all right. Come along in. And so, with a most benevolent mouth on his successious visits, all purpose as it was with the cold, this very well meaning gentleman took the snow child by the hand and led her towards the house. She followed him droopingly and reluctant, for all the glow and sparkle was gone out of her figure and varied just before she had resembled a bright, frosty, star gem evening. With a crimson gleam on the cold horizon, she now looks as dull and lanky as a thaw. As kind Mr. Lindsay led her up in steps of the door, Violet and Peony looked into his face, their eyes full of tears, 
bit first before they could run down their cheeks. And again, entreated him not to bring their snow image into the house. Not bring her in! exclaimed the kind-hearted man. Why, you are crazy, my little violet. Quite crazy, my small puny. She's so cold already that her hands has almost frozen mine. In spite of my thick crops, would you have her freeze to death? His wife, as he came up the steps, has been taking another long earnest, almost awe stricken gaze at the little white stranger. She hardly knew whether it was a dream or no, but she could not help fancying that she saw the delicate prints of Violet's fingers on the child's neck. It looked just as if, while Violet was shaping out the image, she had given it a gentle pat with her hand and had neglected to smooth the impression quite away. After all, husband, said the mother, liquoring to her idea that the angels would be as much delighted to play with Violet and Peony as she herself was. After all, she does look strangely like a snow image. I do believe she is made of snow. A puff of the west wind blew against the snow child, and again she sparkled like a star. Snow! repeated good Mr. Lindsay, drawing the reluctant guest over his hospitable they show. No wonder she looks like snow. She's half frozen, poor little thing, but a good fire will put everything to rights. With our talk, and always with the same best intentions, this highly benevolent and common sensible individual led the little white damsel drooping, drooping, drooping more and more out of the frosty air and into his comfortable parlor. A Heidenberg stove filled to the brim with intensely burning at track side was sending a bright grim through the in grass of its iron door and causing the vest of water on its top to foam and bubble with excitement. A warm, sultry smell was diffused throughout the room. A thermometer on the wall farthest from the stove stood at 80 degrees. The parlor was hung with red curtains and covered with a red carpet and looked just as warm as it felt. The different bed vexed, the atmosphere here and the cold, wintry twilights out of doors, was like stepping at once from Nova Sembla to the hottest parts of India, or from the North Pole into an oven. Oh, this was a fine place for the little white stranger. The common sensible man placed the snow child on the hot rug right in front of the hissing and filming stove. Now she will be comfortable, cried Mr. Lindsay, rubbing his hands and looking about him with the pleasantest mouth you ever saw. Beg is at home, my child. Sad, sad and drooping, looked the little white maiden as she stood on the half rug with the hot brass of the stove striking through her like a Pestilence. Once she threw a glance wistfully toward the windows and caught a glimpse through its red curtains of the snow covered roofs and the stars grimly frostily and on the lilied intensity of the cold night. The bleak wind rattled the windows pins as if it were summoning her to come forth. But there stood the snow shell, drooping before the hot stove, but the common sensible man saw nothing amiss. Come, wife, said he, let her have a pair of thick stockings and a woolen shawl or blanket directly and tell Dora to give her some warm supper as soon as the milk boils. You, Violet and Peony, amuse your little friend. She's out of spirits, you see at finding herself in a strange place 
For my part, I will go round among the neighbors and find out where she belongs. The mother, meanwhile, had gone in search of a shawl and stockings for her own view of the matter. However, subtle and delicate, had given way, as is always did, to the stubborn materialism of her husband, without heeding the remonstrances of his two children, who still kept murmuring that their little snow a sister did not love the warm. Good Mr. Lindsay took his departure, shutting the parlor door carefully behind him. Turning up the collar of his sack over his ears, he emerged from the house and had barely reached the street gate when he was recalled by the screaming of Violet and Peony and the rapping of tumble fingers against the parlor window. Husband, husband! cried his wife, showing her horror striking face through the window pins. There is no need of going for child parents. We told you, father! Screaming while and peony as he re-entered the parlor. You would bring her in, and now our poor dear beautiful little snow sister is dark. And their own sweet little faces were already dissolved in tears, so that the father, seeing what strange things occasionally happen in this everyday world, felt not a little anxious least. His children might be going to thaw too. In the utmost perplexity, he demanded an explanation of his wife. She could only reply that being summoned to the parlor by the cries of Violet and Peony, she found no trace of the little white maiden, unless it were the remains of a heap of snow, which, while she was gazing at it, melted quite away upon the hard rack. And there you see all that is left of it, added she, pointing to a pool of water in front of the stove. Yes, father, said Violet, looking reproachfully at him through her tears. There's all that is left of our dear little snow sister. No, dear father, cried Peony, stamping his foot. And I shudder to say, shaking his little fist at the common sensible man, we told you how it would be. What fun did you bring her in? And the Hindenburg stove, through the icing grass of its door, seemed to glare at good Mr. Lindsay like a red eye demon, triumphing in the mischief which it had done. This, you will observe, was one of those rare cases which yet will occasionally happen where common sense finds itself at fault. The remarkable story of the snow image, though to the sagacious class of people to whom good Mr. Lindsay belongs, it may seem but a childish affair, is nevertheless capable of being moralized in various methods. Greatly for their edification, one of its lessons, for instance, might be that its behoof men, and especially men of benevolence, to consider well what they are about, and before acting on their philosophic purposes, to be quite sure that they comprehend the nature and all the relations of the business in hand. What has been established as an element of good to one being may prove absolute mischief to another, even as the warmth of the parlor was proper enough for children of flesh and blood. Like Violet and Peony, though by no means very wholesome, even for them, but involve nothing short of annihilation to unfortunate snow image. But after all, there is no teaching anything to wise men of good Mr. Lindsay stamped. They know everything. Oh, to be sure, everything that has been, and everything that is, and everything that, by any future possibility, can be. And choose some phenomenon of nature or providence transcends their system. They will not recognize it. 
even if it come to pass under their very noses. Wife, says Mr. Lindsay after a feast of silence, see what a quantity of snow the children have brought in on their feet. It has made quite a puddle here before the stove. Pray tell Dora to bring some towels and mop it up.